Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar, What Lifestyle Medicine Offers for Spondyloarthritis. I'm your host, Alina Zlanian, Director of, Director of Programs at SAA. SAA is a nonprofit organization focused on meeting the needs of the spondylitis community. We're committed to research, support, education, and advocacy. And we couldn't do any of it without the support of our members and donors. So a big thank you to you for making today's program possible and for your ongoing support. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Micah Yu, who is a current rheumatology fellow at Loma Linda University Health. Dr. Yu is board certified in lifestyle medicine from the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. He's currently also undergoing training in functional medicine and plans to open a private practice in Newport Beach, California. You can find him on Facebook and Instagram at myautoimmunemd. And welcome Dr. Yu and thank you so much for lending us your time and expertise today. We're so excited to hear from you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Micah Yu, and today I'll be talking about what lifestyle medicine offers for spinal arthritis, and I am a rheumatologist. I have nothing to disclose. A little information about me. So I'm currently a rheumatology fellow at Loma Linda University in California. Um, I'll be starting my new job in about a couple days from now. I'll be graduating this month. Uh, I'll be a rheumatologist and the chief medical officer at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine in Newport Beach, California. The Institute of Plant-Based Medicine, it'll be a new multi-specialty clinic that I'm creating with other <laughs> physicians that also includes gastroenterology, uh, cardiology, primary care, registered dietitians, and also other specialties through telemedicine as well. I'm currently certified in lifestyle medicine, and I'm currently getting trained in functional medicine as well. For those of you who don't know what lifestyle medicine is, uh, we'll be going into that today. And functional medicine sort of is similar to lifestyle medicine, but different in other ways as well. Functional medicine also focuses on environmental toxins and uh, food, as well as other um, factors um, in lifestyle medicine. So what are the objectives of today's talk? We're going to learn a little about what spondyloarthritis is, understand the gut microbiome and its role in spondyloarthritis, and also know the pillars of lifestyle medicine. In particular, we're going to be focusing on these five factors, which is not all the pillars, nutrition, exercise, sleep, stress reduction, and smoking cessation. So what is spondyloarthritis? Well, the American College of Rheumatology defines spinal arthritis as a type of arthritis that attacks the spine, and in some people, the joints of the arms and legs. It can also involve the skin, intestines, and eyes. The main symptom in most patients is low back pain. This occurs most often in axial spondyloarthritis. So this is what I define as a spondyloarthritis family. This is um, not the current classification criteria, but this is generally uh, different diseases that we call spondyloarthritis. So if you have psoriatic arthritis, if you have ankylosing spondylitis, reactive arthritis, if you have inflammatory bowel disease that's associated with arthritis, or if you've ever had anterior uveitis as well, that's part of the spondyloarthritis family. Now, the current classification criteria for spinal arthritis divides it into axial and peripheral spinal arthritis. So we're talking a little bit about um, two different things of the same uh, disease process. So what causes spinal arthritis? So in general, um, if we look at spinal arthritis, we're looking at part of it is attributed to genetics. The other part is due to environment. And the sum of these will give you immune-mediated rheumatic disease, and in this case, spondyloarthritis. So you don't, if you don't have the genetics for it, you probably can't get spondyloarthritis. But if you don't have the right environmental factors involved, you probably can't get spondyloarthritis as well. So you have to have both. And today we'll be focusing on the environmental part. So let's talk a little bit about the microbiome. So this is a hot topic in the past uh, decade or two. So we have 
bacteria all over our body, not only on our skin, but also our lungs, our um, and our gut as well. So, all right, the gut microbiome. I'm sure many of you have heard this. A lot of you probably have heard it's something called gut health, a uh, healthy gut microbiome. So, what is gut health? So, so let's go back to the basics. So, our gut is made up of a lot of different bacteria, and the bacteria in our gut can be influenced by many factors, as shown in this slide. It can be uh, influenced by the way you were born. So pregnancy plays a huge role. So if you were born through C-section versus uh, natural birth, that does change the flora of your gut bacteria. Diet also plays a huge role. Studies have shown that, oh, a diet, um, one meal can change the bacteria in your gut as well. Gender also plays a role. Genetics also um, help determine this. Previous infections, if you've ever taken antibiotics, that also changes your gut flora. Stress, uh, age also affects it. Other factors that um, are not on the slide is sleep. Exercise also um, changes your microbiome. And your microbiome, particularly your gut microbiome, can um, help induce autoimmune disease when it's out of balance. So what have we found in um, the gut microbiome and spondyloarthritis? So what we have found, and this is a proven literature, is that there's something called gut dysbiosis in spondyloarthritis, including ankylosing spondylitis and psoriatic arthritis. So what this is, what gut dysbiosis means is that there's an imbalance um, between your good bacteria and your bad bacteria. And when you have gut dysbiosis, that can cause something called the leaky gut. So let me break this down for you. So when your gut bacteria is in homeostasis, when it's in balance, you have one, so in your gut, there's one cell line uh, between the immune system and the lumen of your gut where the food flows through. And 60% of your immune system is located at the gut. So when you have gut dysbiosis or when your gut bacteria is out of balance, your, the one cell line that's separating the immune system from your gut, um, that's broken down, such as the figure in the right. It's supposed to be very tight, held by something called tight junctions, so that bad bacteria, little food particles won't leak through. Okay, so if it doesn't leak through, then it won't interact with the immune system in a bad way, okay? But if it does leak through, if you have bad bacteria, um, food particles that you can be as sensitive to, it can start interacting with your immune system and send off inflammatory signals throughout your whole body and possibly make your joint pains worse and your symptoms worse. So that's why it's important to try to keep your gut in homeostasis and try to avoid the leaky gut. So that's just a little bit overview of what the gut microbiome is and what gut dysbiosis is in spondyloarthritis. So we're gonna jump into treatment. So many of you will probably notice that some of these medications are what you are using. These are medications that we use in allopathic medicine to treat spondyloarthritis. So if we look at disease modifying agents, um, they're known as methotrexate, sulfasalazine, leflunamide. These are some of our oral medications. Now, if we look into our biologics, which some of you might be taking as well, adalumumab, etanercept, sertoluzumab, golumumab, and infliximab are your TNF-alpha inhibitors. And interleukin-17 inhibitors are your secukinumab and exakizumab. These are all tongue twisters, I know, but it's, it's very hard to say. It takes many years of repetition to repeat these uh, fluently. Your interleukin-12 and 23 your interleukin-12 and 23 inhibitors are estacunumab, and your JAK inhibitor is your tofacitinib. So all these medications are used in spondyloarthritis. So we've talked about pharmaceutical drugs already, but what other treatments are out there? Um, some of you might go to your rheumatologist um, and you want you don't want medication sometimes and you want to know what's out there. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today. So lifestyle medicine 
is a new field of uh, medicine. It's a new specialty that was developed in 2004 at Loma Linda University. And now it uh, has national conferences and many, many physicians, nurse practitioners, nurses, PAs are involved with this and getting certified in lifestyle medicine. What lifestyle medicine is, it has six pillars, which is healthful eating, whole food, plant-based food in particular, uh, exercise, uh, stress management, relationships, sleep, and cessation of tobacco and substance use or abuse. So today we're going to be focusing on nutrition, exercise, stress, and sleep, and tobacco use. So nutrition is so important to a rheumatic disease. And in particular, spinal arthritis. A lot of the nutrition that you do need is right there in your grocery store. You don't need to go out there and buy hundreds of supplements to help yourself. You need it, you, all the food you need and all the benefits of food for your immune system are right there in the produce section. So what diet should we stick to I'm sure you've heard the autoimmune protocol diet, the carnivore diet, the keto diet, the vegan diet, a Mediterranean diet, whole food plant-based diet, pescatarian diet, and a vegetarian diet. So there's so many diets out there. Everyone talks about, oh, this diet helped me. This other diet helped me. So what's the evidence out there? Should we really be eating a keto diet or should we be sticking to a pescatarian diet or a whole food plant based diet? Now, what we should not be eating is what's called the SAD diet, which is also known as the standard American diet. A standard American diet is probably a very tasty diet and which many Americans are on. So in the morning, you'll have a very sugary breakfast cereal for lunch, you might have a hamburger, and then you make, make your way to have a hot dog as well. And then on the side, you're gonna have french fries. And then for snacks, you're gonna have um, potato chips. And then for dinner, you're gonna have dessert such as cheesecake and ice cream. So this diet is loaded full of sugar, processed food, um, a lot of um, refined meat and a lot of oil, um, so a lot of saturated fat as well. So we do not want to be on this diet. So we're going to talk about fiber. So this will be our first poll. Um, so what percent of the U.S. meets the minimum requirement for daily dietary fiber intake per day? of 25 grams for women and 30 grams, 38 grams for men. And this is from uh, the USDA recommendations. So we'll end polling in um, three, two, one. Okay, so we have percents all over the place, um, but majority of you have said 15%. You're close. It's actually 5% only meet the minimum requirement um, for fiber in the United States, which is shocking. So that's why I'm gonna emphasize fiber today and its benefits. So foods with fiber. So fiber can come from any of these sources. So you can get it from whole grains, you can get it from beans, lentils, your uh, fruits and vegetables as seen in this um, picture, your um, pasta now can have, there's chickpea pasta, there's edamame pasta, black bean pasta, whole wheat pasta, there's your almonds, your walnuts. So all of these foods have fiber. 
and you want to emphasize these foods because in in the blue zones, which um, some of you might have heard of, these are the places in the world um, that live the longest, and there's five of them. In the United States, we have Loma Linda, California, where I'm from. Uh, there's Nicoya, Costa Rica, Sardinia in Italy, Ikaria in Greece, and Okinawa, Japan. So some of you have heard of Okinawa potatoes, which is one of my favorite sweet potato, uh, purple potatoes. And what these places have in common are that uh, they do emphasize um, stress reduction, um, but they also emphasize uh, fiber as well. Um, they're a plant predominant um, societies in um, the world, and they do incorporate other foods such as some meat, maybe some fish, but most of their diet comes from plants and fiber. What are the benefits of dietary fiber? So this is a systematic review and a meta-analysis. A systematic review and a meta-analysis are one of the strongest studies we have in medicine. And that's what we look at as a gold standard. So this included 200 studies in this meta-analysis. So they look at all these different studies. And what they found out with fiber was that there was a 15 to 30% decrease in all-cause mortality and incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke incidence, type 2 diabetes, and colorectal cancer. When comparing the highest dietary fiber consumers with the lowest consumers, also they found that there was a lower body weight, systolic blood pressure, and total cholesterol when they compared the highest dietary fiber intakes compared to a lower intake group. And the risk reduction, surprise, surprise, the daily intake um, that they found with the greatest reduction was between 25 grams and 29 grams. So fiber is so important to our overall health and it can help with our immune system as well. So dietary fiber is also anti-inflammatory. So this study was done looking at the NHANES, which is a survey done across the United States. And this looked at the NHANES data from 1999 to 2010. And what they found was that the greater the dietary fiber intake was the lower the incidence of metabolic syndrome, which is defined by um, cholesterol, diabetes, and um, hypertension, high blood pressure. And also the lower the reduction, the lower the inflammation was as well, which is defined by the lab C reactive protein in this case. And also the incidence of obesity went down as the dietary fiber intake went up. So as you can see, dietary fiber can have a number of benefits for your body, not only for spinal arthritis, but also for your overall health. And in terms of your gut microbiome, dietary fiber is also beneficial because it raises something called T regulatory cells in your body, which is found to be decreased in the number of rheumatic disease. T regulatory cells help your immune system to say, hey, this is a part of our body. We shouldn't be attacking it. And in a lot of rheumatic diseases, um, our bodies are attacking itself. So we do want to raise the T regulatory cells, which fiber can help. Now let's look at knee pain. So this was done on patients with osteoarthritis, which is not spinal arthritis, but some of us may have a combination of osteoarthritis and spinal arthritis, which, is, which I've seen in many cases. So we looked at the dietary fiber intake in relation to knee pain trajectory. And this was done in one of our big rheumatology journals. So they looked at patients ages 45 to 79 and they followed them for a total of eight years. And what they found was that the higher the intake of dietary fiber, the lower uh, the severity of the patient's uh, knee pain over time, and also the lower the risk of development. And, and surprise, surprise, once again, the dietary fiber intake that they recommended was 25 grams per day. So we're hitting a magic number of 25 grams per day. Now, let's continue on with food. How many of you have heard of phytonutrients? That's not something that we talk about much in medical school. In medical school, we don't get much nutrition training. At most, we probably get uh, 10 hours of nutrition training, and sometimes it's not even relevant. So 
you learning about final nutrients alone might make you smarter than your average doctor on nutrition. So we're going to dive a little bit into phyto nutrients, which is found in lots of fruits and vegetables. Each color has a different phyto nutrient. So what I always recommend to my patients when they ask me, what fruits and vegetables should I be eating? I tell them, you should be eating the rainbow. Eat every type of color that you can find. The reason why is because each color has different phyto nutrients. Phyto nutrients have a different function in our body. Um, if I'm sure some of you have heard of beta carotene. That's a phytonutrient. You can find that in carrots. It's in the color orange and it can help with the eye and it can also help with the immune system. Lycopene is found in the color red, which is found in tomatoes. Also, um, sulforaphane is uh, known for its anti-cancer properties. It's known to decrease the risk of cancer and that can be found in broccoli, Brussels sprouts, and cauliflower and also and bok choy. Uh, allicin is another phytonutrient that's found in garlic and some of you have also heard of turmeric. Turmeric is a very hot um, popular phytonutrient these days. It's not spicy, it's actually bitter. What I mean by hot in that it's very popular in society. That I'm sure you've seen turmeric supplements as well at your different grocery stores. So turmeric is known for its anti-inflammatory properties. That's why it's very popular. So I do recommend um, taking your phytonutrients, not in supplement form, but in uh, food form. Because you know, you, you, you never know what a high amount of supplements can do to your body. In the past, they've done a study on uh, beta carotene supplementation on smokers. And what they found was that when they gave the beta carotene supplements to um, smokers, they actually found a higher incidence of lung um, cancer in these patients. So that's why it's, you have to be very, very careful of supplements. Um, they're not FDA approved. That's why it's best to get it in food form because you're getting it in the way that nature intended it for you to take it. And it's um, in small amounts where it can help your body. Moving on to another topic in nutrition, omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. Omega-3 fatty acids are a fatty acid that you do want to take and omega-6 fatty acids is something that you might want to avoid. So looking at the cascade of omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids, so we're, we'll first start on the omega-6 fatty acid side. So when you take in omega-6 fatty acids, it breaks down to something called arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid breaks down to different substances in our body. And this is what um, ibuprofen, um, meloxicam, uh, naproxen, these are the your NSAIDs, um, non-steroidal pain medicines. And this is a pathway that it blocks. Now, when you eat um, red meat, uh, sometimes eggs, uh, French fries, like, because you have cooking oil when you're frying foods, your processed food, there's a lot of um, uh, omega-6 fatty acids. Sorry, can you hear me? I actually, I think my speaker went off. Um, I was low on battery. Hopefully you guys can hear me still. If you can, we can hear you, yes. Great, okay. So, um, so your omega-6 fatty acids breaks down to orochidonic acid and it is inflammatory. So this is what these types of different foods can do for you. Um, but omega-3 fatty acids are anti-inflammatory and they break down at the very end to something called resolvents or protectants. These are your anti-inflammatory signals in your body. So when your, your joint pains are getting better, your rashes are getting better, your resolvents and protectants are at work. And where do you get omega-3 fatty acids? You get it from fish, um, you get it from uh, flax seeds, chia seeds, uh, you can also get it from uh, omega-3 fatty acid um, supplements as well. Olive oil is another popular oil uh, that has omega-3 fatty acids. That's why the Mediterranean diet is so popular. And that's why you saw, um, I think it was Sicily and Italy was one of the uh, blue zones in the world. Now, if you're vegan, um, the omega-3 fatty acids that you get uh, through food is probably not enough. Uh, because um, it only breaks down to one part of the omega-3 fatty acid chain. You do need to convert it to um, 
DHEA um, um, right here. Uh, doc, doxo, I can't even spell it. Uh, something acid, D acid, I'll just call it that. And you get these through fish. Um, so if you are vegan and you want the most um, complete omega-3 fatty acids, you probably want to look at an algae-based uh, omega-3 fatty acid supplementation because fish, where do they get their omega-3 fatty acids from? They don't generate it. They actually get it from the algae in the ocean. So when you're getting it in supplement form as a vegan and you take the algae form, then you're just getting it straight from the source. Um, but they're no different. Um, it's up to you how you want to take it. So moving on to some inflammatory uh, substances, salt. So excess salt can be inflammatory. Um, this one well, from the New England Journal of Medicine. So when you eat excess salt, it increases the inflammatory signals in our body. Now, I'm, this is shocking to many people, including people that don't have rheumatic disease. So it increases something called interleukin-6, interleukin-1, 6, and 23. It also increases in interleukin 17 as well, as well as T helper 17s. And just to help you understand um, why this is inflammatory and what we're doing in rheumatology. So anakinra is a medication, a biologic we give in rheumatology that blocks interleukin 1. Tocilizumab is a JAK inhibitor we give for some of spondyloarthritis. It blocks interleukin, um, it blocks, uh, sorry, tocilizumab is a uh, interleukin 6 inhibitor and it blocks um, into looking six. Ustakinumab uh, blocks into looking 23. Adalumumab, it blocks TNF alpha inhibitor, and secukinumab blocks into looking 17. So as you can see, we have different medications in rheumatology that blocks these different pathways that are stimulated when you eat excess salt. And excess salt can increase T helper 1 and T helper 17 cells and decrease T inhibitory cells. So T helper 1 and T helper 17 cells are your T cells in your body that are inflammatory. So you don't want to increase these T cells. You only want to increase these T cells when you're fighting infection and when your body is in balance. Your T inhibitory cells are what you want to increase. Uh, like I said earlier, your T inhibitory cells are decreased in a lot of rheumatic disease, and that's what helps you um, stay um, well in rheumatic disease and prevent flip. So you want to increase your T inhibitory cells. T inhibitory cells are very also important when you're fighting infection and viruses in your body, because that's what helps your body to say, hey, we're done fighting this infection already. We don't need to keep sending signals to fight this infection. So your T inhibitory cells come in and calm down your body to fight, um, to stop fighting the infection when you're done um, with a battle. So the T-ray cell cells are so important and excess salt will, can decrease the amount because it's increasing your T helper 17 in one cell. So we're done about nutrition there. So that's a brief overview of how nutrition can influence your body. So let's talk about physical activity next. So another poll question. How much exercise should we be getting in a week? So we'll give just a few more seconds and end polling. Okay. Many of you are overly ambitious. So actually, um, the minimum requirement needed is actually 1.5 hours a week, according to the United States Health and Human Services. Um, you can get two and a half hours a week. That's not a problem. Um, the more the merrier, but one and a half hours a week is the minimum requirement. So according to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, um, they mentioned that adults should be getting at least 150 minutes or two and a half hours to 300 minutes a week of moderate intensity. But if you do intense uh, exercise, 
then you do need 75 minutes to 150 minutes uh, less, uh, only. Um, and you could do a qu equivalent of moderate to rigorous intensity aerobic activity. You can lift weights, you can stretch. That's all part of exercise. So, so there's been some articles out there talking about the benefits of exercise. Um, in this study, they looked at the um, benefits of Pilates and of ankylosing spondylitis. So this is a pilot study, which means it's a very, very early um, study. And um, it just looked at some of the benefits. Um, it wasn't a very rigorous study, but they did find that at the very bottom of the conclusion, they found that the findings suggest that Pilates training could be useful in ankylosing spondylitis patients um, but they did say that um, there needs to be more bigger trials um, needed. So Pilates, for many of you that don't know, it's, a, it's like yoga. Um, I haven't done it personally, but looking at some of the forms that they use, it's similar to yoga. Another study done um, in the International Journal of Rheumatology is that they looked at the role of land and aquatic exercise in ankylosing spondylitis, and this was a review article. Uh, systematic review. So they looked at a bunch of studies. So it looked at 35 studies in this, and they found that there was a positive effect of exercise on pain and disease activity. So it actually improved the pain and disease activity. And um, they said that the results uh, support educational sessions as well as home-based programs. So if you look at some of the literature that is given you, um, exercise can help in the form of stretching, in the form of uh, running, uh, pull therapy, weightlifting. So anything that you can tolerate, I suggest you do. Exercise can be anti-inflammatory. Um, I don't mention in this um, talk, but um, exercise does send out something called interleukin-6 um, from the muscles. And when it comes from the muscles, it's actually anti-inflammatory. But when it comes from other parts of your body, it, it's pro-inflammatory. So exercise sends out the anti-inflammatory kind of interleukin-6 so to help decrease inflammation. So a lack of exercise can contribute to inflammation. This is from a, a prestigious uh, journal called uh, Nature Review, um, and this is Nature Review Rheumatology. And they looked at what happens when you have physical inactivity, and they say that you know when you do have physical inactivity, um, you do accumulate more fat, and more fat um, leads to more um, white blood cells that can go into your um, blood system and that induces um, different uh, parts of your body to be involved, such as um, uh, you get insulin resistance, um, type 2 diabetes, you get atherosclerosis, also known as plaques building up in your blood vessels. That's how you get heart attacks. It can contribute to uh, Alzheimer's disease, anemia, and you know, when you don't um, exercise, sometimes you get more joint pain from uh, inflammation, and when you get more inflammation in your joints, you want to exercise less. So it's a vicious cycle. So anything you can to break the cycle, even just a little bit of exercise, 10 minutes of exercise is important. So any way to move outdoors or indoors. So next we're going to talk uh, briefly about stress. Stress, um, some of you have noticed, does contribute to your pain, and um, it's very important to focus on stress. So what can we do for stress? That's one of the pillars of lifestyle medicine. You can do Tai Chi, um, you can meditate, do breathing exercises. Cognitive behavioral therapy is very useful as well. Talking to a psychologist, um, finding a friend to just talk about your problems, unloading um, your feelings that you've been holding up inside um, is very important. Also, hobbies. Uh, I used to play piano, and this is how I felt about playing piano. I was um, very tired of it, but um, I'm very glad I um, play piano now. It's a hobby of mine. Um, I find it to be very therapeutic, and there is a form of um, healing out there, medicine out there called music therapy. Um, so any way to keep up with your hobbies can be very therapeutic for your arthritis. Smoking. Um, is very inflammatory as well. Um, for those of you that smoke, it's very important to minimize or even eliminate smoking. So this was a observational study done on 92 ankylosing spondylitis patients. So basically they didn't do any um, particular, they didn't give them any interventions. They just um, grouped the patients 
to either smoking or non-smoking and they observed how they did. And what they found was that they um, found significant improvements in disease activity, physical mobility, and quality of life in ankylosing spondylitis patients who quit smoking. So some of my patients that I treat, I've noticed that when they do smoke, even if they smoke a little bit or they smoked in the past, it's harder to um, treat these patients and improve their pain activity with the pharmacological medications that I get. And when they do sm stop smoking, sometimes their, um, their disease actually can improve even without medications. Next, we're gonna be talking about sleep. So we're gonna have another poll question here. How much sleep should we get? So I changed up the um, answers D and E. So actually answer D and E should be seven to nine hours and E should be 10 to 12 hours. So just base it off of um, the answer choices on this PowerPoint instead of this um, poll here. I changed it last minute. So a couple more seconds, and then we're gonna show our answers. Great, seven to eight hours, or so and am I a PowerPoint for seven to nine hours, that's correct. So um, too much sleep is not good for you, too little sleep is not good for you as well. Seven to nine hours is uh, what the National Sleep Foundation recommends, I think the American College of Lifestyle Medicine say about seven to eight hours. So if you get that general time frame, then um, that's, um, that's the most beneficial. And you do want this to get this continuous. You don't want a broken sleep overnight. So there was a study that found um, on how sleep affects um, ankylosing spondylitis and non-rheographic axial spondyloarthritis. And what they did find in study was that poor sleepers had higher disease activity and fatigue scores and more nighttime back pain than good sleepers. So some of you have noticed, um, and I've noticed as well, in different um, rheumatic diseases, including lupus, rheumatic, or, or rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, um, ankle spondylitis, um, I've noticed that when my patients do get bad sleep, when they get insomnia, broken sleep, um, their disease activity does go up. Sometimes their blood levels of inflammation go up as well. So it's very important for you to find a way to sleep right. Um, you want to get rid of the television um, from your bedroom. You want to um, maybe put the phone away. Don't look at your phone um, in the last hour or two before you sleep. Um, there's been studies that come, are coming out about blue light that affects sleep. You do want to make the room completely dark. Um, try not to have any night lights. Um, you want to increase the amount of melatonin that's generated from um, naturally from your body when you sleep. Um, you, another strategy is you can put your cell phone outside the door and just put a natural clock in our room with a natural alarm system, which uh, many of us are not doing anymore. We're using our phone um, to actually uh, use it as our alarm clock. And there has been some studies, I mean, um, that functional medicine talks about um, EMF um, coming from phones that may be contributing to um, sleep quality as well. But overall, um, any strategy you can find that improves sleep is the most important. So a recap. So lifestyle medicine is important for improving spinal arthritis and overall health. Eating dietary fiber from whole foods is important for your health. Try to meet the minimum dietary recommendation of 25 grams per day. Try to eat the rainbow and include different types of fruits and vegetables. Exercise can be anti-inflammatory and help with pain. It is important to either minimize or eliminate smoking completely. Poor sleep can be associated with higher disease activity and pain. 
Thank you very much. Uh, you can find me on Instagram and Facebook at my MD. So I'll be working as a rheumatologist at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine in Newport Beach, California. I'll be taking, I'll be doing telemedicine and in-person visits. Um, I'll be licensed in different states throughout the United States. I'm currently licensed in Florida and California. I'm adding on different states. So if you want me to see you, you can let me know and I'll try to get licensed in those states as well. And I'll be coming out with my personal website and my clinic's website will be coming out as well shortly. So if you want to file more, find out more information, please follow me on Instagram and Facebook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Yu. That uh, truly informative and, and helpful presentation. And right on time, 10.45, we are oh, moving wow. to our, yeah. <laughs> A for perfect timing. We're now moving into our Q&A session. Um, I've already gathered quite a, a large number of questions as people have been typing in their questions during the presentation. Um, so I'll be reading some of those. You can still continue to um, type them into the Q&A module if you haven't yet. And I'll be um, reading questions for Dr. Yu to answer. So, um, okay. Our first question is, uh, Dr. Yu, what diet do you yourself follow and why? Yeah, so um, each, in the, so I, I don't think I mentioned this. I do have a, I do have spinal arthritis myself. So I am a patient also, um, and I have gout as well, as well as pseudogout. So I have three different rheumatic diseases. Um, just to let you know, I don't think everyone should be doing this, but I don't take any um, allopathic medications currently. Um, I was on them before, but with um, lifestyle modifications and my diet, I've been able to um, dramatically improve my disease process. And the diet that I follow is a whole food plant-based diet. Um, so what that means is that I don't eat dairy. I try to minimize it. I don't eat meat. I don't eat fish. I stick to uh, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables. Um, and Basically, uh, it's basically a vegan diet without any processed food. That's what a whole food plant-based diet basically is. Um, it can be hard to follow, but that's what they found. Um, and the patients that, people that live the longest in the world, they do follow um, a plant-predominant diet. So a lot of fiber. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so the next uh, set of questions is about um, leaky gut. So how can we heal a leaky gut and how long does it usually take? Um, and does eating fiber prevent the leaky gut syndrome that you mentioned? Yeah. Or what else helps it? So, so the leaky gut that I'm talking about is not uh, the same as a leaky gut syndrome. Leaky gut syndrome is something that um, functional medicine uh, providers um, look at. Functional medicine, just to let you know, is a form of alternative medicine. It's not a specialty of allopathic medicine, such as rheumatology. So functional medicine can be done by naturopaths, can be done by chiropractors, can be done by any type of um, uh, person that does any form of um, uh, what you call alternative or traditional medicine. Um, so leaky gut itself is a term that is being used in allopathic medicine now. So what that means is basically um, your tight junctions where the cell line dividing your immune system and your um, gut lumen is um, basically opened up. So bad stuff can go through, like I mentioned earlier. Um, in terms of how to Im um, heal your gut um, to improve like the imbalance of your bacteria, we don't know at this time, every individual is different. We're just at the infancy of this research. If back in the nineties, there wasn't much uh, literature on this, but in the past decade, um, you'll know, if you look on um, the studies, there's so many studies come out every day about the gut microbiome and gut dysbiosis. Um, so we really don't know how long it takes to heal the gut um, and improve um, the leaky gut, uh, but time, time will tell. And as far as if, if genetics are involved, yes, genetics can be involved. Um, just having an HLA-B27 gene um, can cause um, uh, get dysbiosis, and they did find they, an article did come out about that in the Arthritis and Rheumatology Journal, I believe it was last year. Because the question always comes up is this from genetics alone, or is this from um, the disease itself? 
And really, we don't have the answer right now. So I would say a combination of genetics and disease causes gut dysbiosis. Wonderful, thank you. Um, how can I improve my sleep when I have a lot of nighttime pain that wakes me? Yeah, so that's difficult. Um, I'm not a sleep specialist. Um, I do recommend you reach out to a sleep specialist. They can find ways to optimize your sleep. So um, one of the common uh, things that prevents people from sleeping well is uh, obstructive sleep apnea, um, which many rheumatologists ask their um, patient whether they're snoring at night. That can prevent patients from sleeping. And caffeine is another big um, trigger of, of insomnia. So if you do have trouble sleeping, if you do need caffeine, I recommend using caffeine early in the morning, not in the afternoon. Um, other interventions that I did mention was that you want to avoid having a cell phone in your room. You want to um, make sure the light is completely dark, pitch black. You want to increase the melatonin that's generated from darkness. Um, you want to avoid having um, any type of television, computer in your room and try to avoid those screens before you sleep. Um, you can read a book before you sleep. That's uh, one of the best ways or meditate or pray or whatever you need to, to help your sleep quality. Thank you. Uh, the next few questions I'm kind of going to consolidate because they all have to do with balancing conf conflicting needs um, of those who have multiple conditions. So, um, you know, what is the right amount of fiber for a colitis recovery period? And then um, kind of goes together that I love high fiber foods, the person says, however, I have lymphomatic colitis and have been hospitalized three times with a blocked intestine. And the GI doc has told me to avoid fiber to prevent blockages. Um, so what yeah. is your advice? I also have spa. Yeah, yeah. So um, having uh, gut issues is pretty common in um, patients with spondyl arthritis. Um, you can get inflammatory bowel disease associated with spondyl arthritis as well, like I mentioned. Um, so I'm not a gut, um, I'm not a gastroenterologist, so I can't speak for the um, gut issues regarding that. But I would say um, if you do, can tolerate fiber, I would say, how, ask yourself how much fiber are you eating? Um, I do recommend starting at a low amount of fiber and then building up eventually. So at the Institute of Plant-Based Medicine, we are a multi-specialty clinic that includes gastroenterologists um, and cardiologists and primary care and different specialties as well. That's gonna be located throughout the United States um, through telemedicine, or you can see us in person as well. So the gastroenterologists that I work with, they are um, lifestyle medicine um, and uh, whole food plant based um, diet trained. So I would recommend um, you reach out to me and I can get you in touch with them because they have been able to get patients um, eating fiber, even though they have inflammatory bowel disease and different gut issues. And a quick follow up. Do you have any thoughts on uh, cooked vegetables versus raw for someone with colitis or Crohn's? Yeah, I think cooked vegetables um, might be easier to digest um, than raw vegetables. Uh, but then again, every individual is different. Uh, we do have registered dietitians that I can connect you with that are plant-based trained as well um, that you can talk to. Um, so the next question is about specific foods to avoid. Um, uh, one person says that they've adopted a paleo diet, but mm -hmm. they have a question about nuts specifically. Um, the, the source that they've been following says to avoid nuts. However, um, uh, she's saying that, you know, many paleo cookbooks use almonds and other nut flours, um, as alternatives to gluten and wheat. So what, what are your thoughts on, on nuts for someone with spa? Yeah, so I can give a brief overview on just some of the dietary conflicting um, information out there. There's so many diets out there. There's a gluten-free diet. There's a paleo diet. There's on, I think the autonomy protocol diet is another paleo diet. Um, there's a keto diet. So when, when it comes to um, the paleo diet, I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but they avoid um, grains. Um, so as far as nuts are concerned, I would not avoid nuts if you don't have any problems. Um, but you want to eat nuts that are salt free because remember in my presentation, I mentioned that excess salt can be inflammatory. So uh, eat nuts and see how you tolerate it. If you can't tolerate, then it might be a sensitivity because um, nuts have fiber and fiber does decrease inflammation. And most of the, you saw the blue zones, people that live the longest in the world do eat nuts. Um, 
So nuts overall are good for you. Walnuts um, are very good for you. That's one of the best nuts. Almonds um, are good as well. Um, so I would encourage you to eat nuts if you can. And as far as gluten is concerned, some of you probably have questions on gluten. Do not avoid gluten if you don't have any problems. Um, if you do notice that you have gluten sensitivity or celiac disease, or if you notice that you have more joint pains on gluten, then you can try to find gluten-free foods. But studies have shown that gluten is actually um, um, very beneficial to our body. Um, patients do um, have an overall health, have better cardiovascular function and different improvements in their organs um, through uh, by eating gluten as well. And uh, just to keep going on diet here, and you probably have questions on nightshades. Nightshades. Yes, that was one. <laughs> Yeah, so nightshades are um, something that I would not avoid. I don't avoid nightshades myself. Nightshades are a group of um, vegetables that include eggplants, potatoes, tomatoes. Um, those are three that I remember. Um, there's probably some other ones, and they do have a skin on them. Um, nightshades are, contain something called lectin that some people might find inflammatory. Um, due to maybe sensitivities, food sensitivities, but overall they are good for your health and they are good for your, um, your spinal arthritis. So if you notice that you, when you eat them, you do get more joint pains, then yes, avoid them. But if you don't notice that you get any joint pains, keep eating them because they're so beneficial for you. And again, they have, they're different colors. There's purple, there's red, there's white, there's um, sweet potatoes. They are different colors. Different colors have five different phytonutrients and they do help with our overall health. Thank you. Um, which vegetables or foods supply turmeric for the yeah. anti-inflammatory? So turmeric is a spice. Um, so turmeric contains something called curcumin, which is one of the active ingredients that are anti-inflammatory in turmeric. Um, there, but there was a study done on the turmeric spice itself. Um, when, they took out, when they took out the active ingredient of curcumin, they actually found that some of the other ingredients in there um, actually also helped with patients' um, inflammation. Or, um, so I would say the best way to take turmeric is through the spice itself. So a lot of Indian cooking, Asian cooking has turmeric. So dash some on your food. Uh, so the way I do it is when I make rice, um, or any type of food, I just sprinkle uh, turmeric in there and my rice looks orange um, and I get the benefits of turmeric as well. So you also put some ginger. Ginger is also anti-inflammatory as well. You can certainly buy the turmeric supplement over the counter, but please uh, talk to your physician to see whether um, you're able to and whether contraindicates with your medications. Uh, but it's important to look for the black pepper extract on the label. Um, on the back as an ingredient because that helps you absorb uh, turmeric because if you don't have the black ex extract then you're just basically um, uh, not absorbing the turmeric for its benefits. Oh. Um, a question on intermittent fasting. What are your thoughts on this? Um, do you recommend patients with spa try practicing this um, to you know improve? Yeah, so everyone's different. Um, I again, I have to emphasize that please talk to your doctor regarding intermittent fasting. So um, intermittent fasting has been shown to improve um, the immune system and in particular decrease inflammation and can help with autoimmune disease. So there's different ways to do intermittent fasting. You can do a 24 hours on, 24 hours off. Um, you can do uh, the six going off 16 hours, going on 18 hours of eating. Uh, so there's multiple ways to go about this. Um, there's some fasting centers in the nation as well, where you don't eat for like several days and just drink water. So, um, so how you want to do it is up to you. But for my patients that might not be uh, controlled, um, they do need an extra boost. Um, Intermittent fasting can be helpful. Um, studies have shown that it can be helpful for aging as well, anti-aging, um, so inflammation. Uh, so yeah, so I would say yes, uh, intermittent fasting can be helpful, but again, please talk to your doctor regarding um, fasting. And with one minute to go, my final question to you, Dr. Yu, is do you have any resources or books that you would recommend about diet, lifestyle, medicine to learn more?
Sorry, the sound's cutting off. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, it was about if you have any resources or books you would recommend about lifestyle medicine or um, nutrition. Yeah, so there's American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Um, it's, I think the URL is ACLM.org. Just type in Google. Um, there's another source, um, Forks Over Knives. Um, it's a documentary um, that's on Netflix. That's a great source as well. There's a lot of good books out there also. Um, you can find it all over Amazon. Um, Fiber Field is a friend of mine um, on Instagram um, who just came out with a book called Fiber Field. That can be helpful. Um, but uh, we have a lot of specialists now in uh, Institute of Plant-Based Medicine that is uh, very competent in lifestyle medicine and plant-based nutrition that can help you with their different diseases as well. Um, so just reach out to me on Instagram and Facebook. I can give you more resources and I'll be putting resources on my website in the future as well. All right. And that will uh, do it for us, everybody. Um, we are out of time. Thank you so much for our guest speaker, Dr. Micah Yu, for a truly, truly wonderful presentation. I have to say, I have, we've done this quite a few times, and I've never seen so many questions come in. Unfortunately, we could not get to even a fraction of them. So my apologies to everyone who did not get your questions answered. Um, we will see if we can, you know, reply back to some of you with things that we can answer, but it was just the volume was, was truly, truly testament to what an important subject this was and um, how much needed this was for our community. So Dr. Yu, thank you so very much. And well, thank you to all of our attendees for spending this last hour with us. We really enjoyed having you. Until next time, goodbye everyone. Thank you everybody, thank you.